So I'll be introducing a fourth kind of surprise and last speaker. Ran Ran is the CEO of Aerobotics. He is one of the first commercial um, dr drones, UAV pilots in the world. I had no idea what that meant before I met him. But what I know is that he's only 34 years old and he's already built four successful companies. He is one of the mind behind the biggest breakthrough today in autonomous dr drones technology, which is quite a, a game-changing. So I'm happy to welcome him on stage. Welcome, Ran. Imagine, imagine you're the head of security for a big power plant, but instead of using fixed cameras or asking one of your team members to conduct a patrol around the facility, a drone does this for you automatically. Imagine you need to run a routine inspection on a cooling tower at a refinery. But instead of the complicated and dangerous process required to conduct such an inspection, a drone does this for you automatically. Imagine you need to measure a stockpile at a mine for inventory purposes on a regular basis. But instead of the labor-intensive process of manually measuring the pile with surveyors, a drone does this for you automatically. Imagine an emergency incident at a big chemical factory. You need to know what's going on as soon as possible so you can quickly respond. But again, instead of sending personnel to assess the situation, a drone can do this for you completely automatically. So I guess uh, by now you've probably understood what I'm here to talk to you about. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about completely automated drones. It sounds a bit futuristic, but before we dive into the future, let's take a quick look into the past. My passion with drones actually started seven years ago when I walked into an electronics store in Canada to buy a juicer. Um, I suddenly saw this shiny box at the corner of the store with a weird-looking aircraft on it, so I ended up leaving the store with no juicer but a really cool toy drone at hand. And I started flying it at every opportunity I had. I was very passionate about this aircraft, and I was especially enchanted by the fact that it could easily balance itself in midair. I mean, this $200 drone was flying in my hotel room just staring at me, and I had this very strong and intense feeling that this was not another product. This was a new platform born. Now, I was too young as an entrepreneur to take advantage of the mobile and internet industries, but I was not about to miss out on this one. And so, I became one of the first licensed commercial UAV pilots in the world. Shortly after, I started Bladeworks. Bladeworks was one of the first companies in the world to offer services with drones. And that's basically where I earned my stripes as a drone operator, flying thousands of hours. And over time, Bladeworks became one of the most experienced and biggest companies in the world for drone services. But as drone operators, we had a problem. Safety. Because drones crash. And as an operator, that's on your mind all the time. So we looked for a solution, but we couldn't find one. So we invented one. We started a company called ParaZero. ParaZero uh, develops uh, pyrotechnic ballistic parachute systems for drones. Uh, it sounds complicated, but it's really not. It's actually a very fast deploying parachute system for drones that usually fly in low altitudes. And that's what this company does. Obviously, that's a big game changer for pilots uh, that are flying drones around the world. Now, the reason I'm telling you about these two companies is that at an early stage of this industry, I was fortunate enough to found and run two companies that were in different vectors, but gave me tremendous insight about where the industry was going. So let's take a closer look at this weird-looking aircraft. This is a multi-rotor. Uh, that's the professional term. Drone is more of a generic term, but it's in common use. There is really nothing new in the core of the aeronautical design of this aircraft. It was actually invented in 1907 by Jacques and Louis Bourguet here in France. But despite their pioneering efforts in the early days of flight, uh, multi-rotors were sidelined by fixed-wing aircraft for a long while. And so a century went by without them reappearing in our day-to-day -day lives. My question is why? And more importantly, why have we seen such a resurgence of these aircrafts in the past decade? 
So, in my opinion, the reason uh, lies in two components, or the development of two, comp two components. First is LiPo batteries. Multi-rotors run on electrical engines, so they need to rely on a stable and powerful uh, power source. So lithium polymer batteries do just that. They have the sufficient energy density to enable drones to fly for a longer period of time. Second is the commercialization of GPS systems which enable drones to easily navigate when they're flying. And these two technologies push this technology really, this industry uh, really hard into the uh, consumer arena. So for the past decade, we've seen tremendous growth in drone use across various applications, uh, creating a situation where global market view and value has been doubling each year, uh, with a forecast of 2.7 million commercial drones in the U.S. alone by 2020, which is crazy. But the industry is not there yet. Now, as uh, drone operators, we were often called into industrial facilities to give services with our drones. But this never lasted, or they never called us back. And we were boggled by this because we saw so much potential for these aircraft to bring real value at these facilities, but it wasn't happening. So we started asking why. And it slow slowly started to dawn on us that the reason for the gap between the potential value that drones could bring here and what was happening in reality was caused due to two main reasons. First off is the technology. Now, it's important to understand that this technology stemmed from the hobby vector. Rightfully so, most uh, manufacturers uh, rushed into those low-hanging fruits arenas of consumer products because that's where the money is, that's where the business is, and it makes sense. But as a result, the technology never matured from toy to tool. And that was a problem, especially for people who wanted to use these aircrafts for professional uses. Second reason uh, is the operator itself. <clears throat> the person actually flying the drone. And what's the problem here? First off, it's expensive. So if you're directing a commercial and you want to shoot some beautiful aerial photography for a video, it makes sense to pay thousands of dollars for someone to come in with a drone and do it for you. But if you want to run a routine inspection of a silo in your factory, it doesn't become uh, very cost effective over time. Second reason is precision. Uh, and the thing here is obviously computers and machines do a better job in being accurate and precise than human operators. Uh, a good drone pilot can fly the perfect mission uh, once or twice, but a computer can do this all the time. So it's much better. And the third is availability. So again, if we imagine an emergency scenario where we have a factory and there is a fire, um, obviously, even if you have your own drone operator at the facility at your demand whenever you need it, it's still going to take you about 10 minutes to set up the drone and get the feed that you need from what's going on. So availability is a, is a very important point. So we set out to create a system that would be completely self-sufficient completely automatic, meaning no person in the loop whatsoever, permanently on site, so whenever you need it, it's there, and hopefully would become the most efficient tool on premises. So our vision was actually to fulfill the potential of drones. The way to do it was to create a completely automated drone system. The general idea was a drone in a box, but in all honesty, uh, we just really wanted to build a flying robot because it's pretty cool. Uh, and that's what we did. We started a robotics. Um, the vision, again, uh, to start with was, you know, in our mind's eye, we saw this facility. Uh, there's a box. There's a drone. The drone can fly out of the box automatically. Uh, and when I talk about true automation, that means no person in the loop whatsoever. No pilot, nothing. To do this, uh, you need a ruggedized box that can withstand different weather situations, and more importantly, you need a drone that is mature enough in terms of technology to actually fly in these harsh environments. So that's what we set up to do. Not an easy challenge, but the first thing we focused on is transitioning and maturing the technology from toy to industrial tool. And that's a very big challenge, especially since most of the components are not there yet. Now, it took the uh, fixed-wing drone industry about a decade to do this, uh, transitioning from the RC model aircraft that we all knew as kids to the big military drones we know today. We wanted to get this done in 18 months. It's a very big challenge. So to do this, we hired 100 very talented people, 
uh, from all engineering facets, mechanical, software, electronical, communications, aerodynamical. We had them working around the clock uh, to get this mission done. Because again, we had to build everything from the ground up. None of the components were uh, suitable or reliable enough to us, for us to account for, for what we were trying to do. Now, the technology is one part of it, and it's very important. There was a very big step forward for us in terms of innovation to get this platform in place. But the second very important question is, where is the value? So having a system like this is very cool, it's very innovative, but what can it really do? We wanted to understand what are the key applications that we can take advantage of with the system. So to do this, we engaged two of our previous customers as drone providers, Intel and ICL. We told them what we wanted to do, which was just a sketch on a paper at the time, but they were excited about it and they decided to become our uh, design partners. So for the first three months, all we did is fly drones manually at their facilities, trying to really map up what are the potential applications and what are the relevant and valuable applications that really mean something to them. About a year ago, we situated our beta system at their facilities, uh, one at Intel, one at uh, ICL, and this was uh, the first time in the world that an automated, completely automated drone system took flight. Um, we did this for the past year. We learned a lot, especially what is missing, what needs to be improved, and what applications are really relevant to run at each client. So our first test facility was uh, Fab 28. It's one of Intel's most efficient manufacturing facilities. 300 acres, employs 5,000 people, and one of their top priorities is security. So that's, what we're, that's the application we focused on there. Now, ICL, uh, Intel Fab 28, has 100 CCTV cameras situated around uh, the factory. So you might ask, why do they need another, another camera? But our camera is completely different. That's what we learned. When something happens, you have this dynamic uh, aerial perspective of what's going on that turns to be very, very valuable for them instead of zooming around looking for where the incident is on fixed cameras. Our second pilot was uh, with ICL. ICL is a leading uh, manufacturer of bromide and potash, and we started a better system in their, uh, in their mine. Now, the focus here was completely different. Uh, it was around volumetric measurements of stockpiles. Um, now, this is a very important uh, process for a mine because everything is banked on this. Future mining, need an inventory, all the operations, the pricing is based on the current inventory levels. And the way it is done, being done today is this. Uh, you have a surveyor uh, running around the pile and uh, manually measuring the stockpile uh, with the GPS, ultimately generating a point cloud base to actually measure the pile. Uh, we wanted to do it differently, which is obviously uh, much easier for a drone. It just flies over the pile, takes a couple of pictures, and then generates uh, the volumetric measurement. So for three months, this is what we did. We did measurements with our drones. Uh, the surveyors um, made their measurements uh, in the old-fashioned way, and we compared. And the results were that the average was about 1.8% of difference. And obviously, we know we are more precise, but uh, there's no absolute level to, pr to prove that, but that was good enough for ICL to say, okay, a new era in volumetric measurement has started, and we are now doing all the surveying uh, in terms of volumetric measurements in ICL in their mind. Now, this is very important because moreover, the fact that it reduces costs and it's much more safe, the idea that they're measuring a stockpile at a specific time once a month because it's very tedious and they need to stop working in other factories in the mine, now they could do it automatically every day. So this had a very big potential to change the way they think about how they operate. So we learned a lot from this better stage, uh, but two main things came up. First, we understood that we need to be able to replace the batteries. Our better system was now charging uh, the battery of the drone. It took about an hour and a half, so if you needed the drone to fly in between, you couldn't do so. And again, for emergency response, that's not relevant, so that was the first thing. Second thing is swapping sensors. The whole idea of a drone flying uh, professionally is to carry a specific sensor to a specific location. 
we wanted to be able to act on various applications, so using multiple sensors would enable us to become from a tool, toy to a tool to a multi-tool. Um, so following, we created our first product, which was much more robust, much more weatherproof, completely automatic, but our main game changer at this point was uh, introducing a, a robotic arm inside the box. And the robotic arm uh, replacing payloads and batteries. So we took care of those two things that we learned from, the, from our pilot uh, doing that. So the robotic arm inside the docking station can take out the battery, replace it with a new one, and uh, using swappable payloads, you can transition from, let's say, you're flying a security mission, uh, you want to change to a, a, a laser meter or a LIDAR, you can swap the actual sensor at the tip of the sword, which is very important. Um, so what did we come up to here so far? We have this robust weatherproof docking station situated uh, at the site uh, that can now swap sensors, swap batteries, so it's completely automatic and a complete multi-tool. We have a drone that's robust enough to fly over the entire facility uh, using this different sensors, but the creme de la creme was being able to transform the data collected with those different sensors into actionable information. And to do that, we started two ecosystems. One for hardware, where we integrate different sensors, uh, enabling our tool to become more of a multi-tool over time. And the second is software, using video analytics or image processing to actually take the data that we're collecting and transition it or transform it into information. So for example, uh, if we're running a security mission uh, with an IR video camera, instead of someone at the command center needing to look at the screen and see what's going on from the drone, we can implement uh, image processing on the video or video analytics to find hotspots of people who are trying to penetrate the, the facility. So that's a big step forward. So uh, remember at the beginning of this uh, <coughs> talk, we talked about 10 years from now with those, those nice sketches. Well, I'd like to tell you that 10 years from now is today. So I'd like to show you a video of our current operation at our test facility and some of our clients. As you can see, the future of drones is now a living, present reality. Thank you very much for your time.